Hello CIS 25, this is part two of the unit four lecture. This part I'm going to go over um, front panel along with motherboard, form factor, and installation um, of components. So as you recall, we did a BIOS lab where we looked at the components that's installed. Um, now your motherboard, when you install your motherboard, um, to the system before the bio stage we would then make sure that we plug in the front panel and this is where you would be able to connect your USB um, sometime your headphones or your microphone and other type of external devices to the actual system which uses the motherboard to transfer um, or submit your request whenever that you um, use a certain device on that particular system. So you would see that there is an audio for the front panel that will be for your headphones and your microphones and your speaker. Um, you also have that in the back. Sometimes it is in analog, which is the round connection. Um, and other times it will be a USB. Then you might have also other connections that you will need um, such as USB and so the front panel I recommend that you refer to motherboard documentation um, and also the label on the motherboard in order to connect and so in this picture right here it shows you that there is a front panel audio which are specific to the pins and the pins are labeled and then on the JCD one here that will be for your DVD drive or your CD drive um, connection so that way you will be able to also um, use that particular drive and then you also have other connection type and so a closer picture of this is going to be something like this which is a different board here you would have speaker and then you would see power label as PW and you would have HD that will be for your hard drive light, the LED light that you see in the front that's usually green or yellow. Um, so we want to be able to connect the appropriate pin to the case and so that way you will be able to use your devices from the front side of the, your computer. And so individual panel on the cable itself you would see that there is a um, the various label on the cable and so you would then connect it. Um, now sometimes you would might be able to use extender so the picture also show extender there. In BIOS for the lab we saw that we were able to look at components configuration such as your drive, your RAM, um, your processor. Now some system will access BIOS through the functional key, like what we see with the Alienware, the Dell. We would press F2 on the keyboard when you first boot the system. So when you boot the system, you want to tap it a few times and be able to access your basic input and output system. Um, and while this is useful, you also see UEFI being integrated for other systems. So that way you would be able to access it through what you would see the OS itself. So in Windows 10, if you go to the recovery mode, you would be able to see UEFI mode. And so that way you can actually view your configuration there. Um, now, BIOS is stored onto a chip and this chip is rewritable um, through the flash process, meaning that we would need to download the BIOS version onto a USB and be able to um, use it if we need to change it or upgrade it. And on page 29, it talks about how you can access BIOS. Some system you would press delete key, other system you would press escape, and it would show when you first start your computer. And if you're not sure, you can always go to manufacturer website to look up the model of your system or the motherboard information and you should be able to find how to access your BIOS because different motherboard uses different BIOS version
and what you want is you want to make sure that you are able to view now when you install new components you new hard drive um, new ram you want to make sure that you check bios to see if it sees the components and if you need to do additional configuration you can set that up there as we've seen in the lab so uefi make sure that we know this for comptia a plus this is a unified extensible firmware initiative um, and it's allowing you to use the graphical user interface with the mouse instead of only the keyboard like what you've seen in the traditional bios so on the UEFI, you would be able to navigate and select the options. You can view the configurations or change the configurations. And once you have completed, you want to save the configuration and exit. Um, so here is a picture of how that would look for a certain BIOS. And um, now the, the system that you have access in the lab is your Alienware. And Alienware has a different BIOS as it pertains to the type of motherboard that it uses. So in this picture right here, that will be for a gigabyte motherboard. And so it would also list your boot sequence, which is very useful um, when you're installing OS or when you're troubleshooting operating system and drives. Now, firmware updates, sometimes it's recommended, um, especially when you're dealing with issues um, in compatibility or mismatch configurations. We want to make sure that we can use a USB or a CD to be able to download the new version of your BIOS, which stores the firmware updates, and you can use that to uh, reinstall or flash your BIOS. Now we can also recover BIOS and recovering BIOS just we want to revert back to the configuration that we previously had. Um, in BIOS usually on the newer um, BIOS it would allow you to store it to a file and then you can transfer that file and put it onto a storage. Um, you can reset BIOS um, by using the jumper which looks like a pin on the motherboard and um, you can also reset it using your CMOS battery, which is a flat round battery that looks like a watch battery. When you remove that battery, um, you can remove it so that way you can reset it and you want to leave it off for about 10, 15 seconds, and then you can plug it back in. So in your system uh, BIOS, it allows you to implement security features such as password if you don't want uh, people to access it. There are also low jack option where you can um, protect the system from physical theft. And then you can also change some of the chassis and also lock your USB through the security feature as we've seen in our lab. Now CMOS battery, here's a picture of that as I mentioned. This battery, usually we would replace it every um, five years or so. Now the sign of battery going bad is when you have um, reboot or you have frequent shut off and that could also mean heat um, but sometimes the battery would go bad. It depends on how often that system is used um, and so we want to make sure that we can replace the battery. So you would take a flathead screwdriver and you would pop this off and make sure that you have to be careful not to break its clip. If you break its clip, you likely will need to replace the motherboard itself. And so the motherboard is the nervous system of your computer. It's used to connect all your devices, your internal components, along with your external components through the ports. And so this battery is used to power your uh, BIOS information for that chip. So it generates enough power to retain the information for your system configuration, and that's needed um, when the system is booting up. And when we did the lab, we also used CPU-Z, which allows us <clears throat> to look at your CPU cores, and then we can also run the test on the CPU. Um, I will create another video, and I will show you how you can install your processor. Um, you want to also use thermal paste on your processor so that way it dissipates the heat and it would uh, act as an adhesion to the heat sink which is the fan and the um, 
metal fins that's on top of your processor to draw the heat from it. Um, all your all your systems from I you know Intel i5 and later you would have virtualization capability along with the AMD concurrent versions. Um, so what you would have is the capability to activate virtualization or VTX on the processor. And this is done through BIOS. So you have to enable that in order to create virtual machines or use virtual machines on your system. Hyperthreading is something that is integrated with Intel technology. Um, and so hyperthreading was developed to do two execution thread for every single processor core. This is why we see, um, you know, the logical core as two times the physical core that is listed in the system. So this is what you see with the i7, i9, or i5. Um, now, the processor speed is really depending on the usage of the processor and how the clock cycle would be. Um, so in the BIOS, you would see that it would list the processor speed along with your operating system when we look at system information in our second lab. When you see that, you would see that that usually is a little bit higher than what you would normally use the system for. But if you're using your system for gaming, sometimes you can turbo boost and bring your processor to top speed. Um, now, bus speed is simply the data path speed on how it would transfer um, or have throughput from your system components to your processor. And your processor is connected to a socket. That socket is on the motherboard. Your motherboard has chipset which are a group of chips that will be in charge of different things, including USB um, and also your BIOS. And we also connect our memory onto the motherboard. So therefore, your motherboard is the nervous system and be able to um, connect all the components so that way we would have a computer um, as a collection of components. So when we overclock, we simply would use what's called the front side bus, which is your FSB, um, and that will be faster than most of your other speed. And so this allows you to change the multiplier of the clock. And so when you modify the multiplier of the clock, you're able to increase the speed that's being transferred on the front side bus. And when you increase the speed, you're able to make the processor work faster. Um, and so on the unlocked version of AMD processor, you would be able to use the software tool that comes with the, op the, the processor itself and be able to change the multiplier there. Or you can just um, drag your mouse to increase the speed as it would have a glide bar. Now, Processor would have what's called integrated graphic processing unit. So if we don't have a graphic card, we would find that either it is an onboard, which is in either integrated onto the motherboard or it would be integrated onto the processor itself. And that will allow you to use the graphic feature for your system. Um, some system would have its own GPU uh, and you can install that onto PCI Express, which is a bus that we would see on um, a motherboard. So now what I will do is I will look through the assignment. And so when you are shopping for motherboard, form factor is very important as you have done the last assignment. The form factor will allow us to determine the physical size of the motherboard so that way we would be able to identify the case of the computer that would fit that motherboard. Um, so if you are buying an ATX motherboard, you would have the size of that will be 12 by 9.6. And on the ATX, it has seven expansion slots, which means that it would have these bus or the, the slot that you can install other components. 
This is used in a full tower case, which is going to be a bigger size case. Then on the second type of form factor, we would see a micro ATX. And the micro ATX, it is a square. It is 9.6 by 9.6. Since it is smaller in size, you would have a four expansion slot. This is used in a smaller case, which is known as a mini tower. Now, can you put the micro ATX into a full tower? You can definitely do that, but you will have a lot of extra room in the case. So if you have a smaller case, such as a mini tower, that will fit the micro ATX. But yes, it does fit onto a regular full tower case. So when you buy a case, it will tell you what kind of form factor that it will be an ATX case. That means that it will fit the motherboard that will be ATX. Then you have a smaller board called the Mini A ITX. And this is also a square, but it is drastically smaller than the ATX. And it is smaller than your micro ATX. So the Mini ITX is 6.6 .6 by 6.6. .6, and it usually just have one expansion slot. That's what you see on the bottom here. And it is used in a mini tower. So when you buy a small case, you can look for mini ITX or micro ITX. Just keep in mind that the mini ITX, you cannot add on a lot of components compared to the other two. So the micro ATX, you can have, you can add on four more devices. And then the, the standard ITX, you can add seven more devices using the expansion slot or the bus. So in the next question number 12, we are going to be able to identify your, um, your board components and slots. So here, what we see is we see a picture of our motherboard, and we're going to start with number one over here. So number one here is going to be your ports. So we would call that your port cluster for number one. That Those are the connection points for all our external devices like speaker, monitor, USB, um, HDMI, and so on. So we can say that that's a group of ports or port cluster. For number two, you would see a slot that would be, can, we can use this to connect adapters such as um, additional Wi-Fi or network interface card or even um, a very small adapter that you can use uh, for Bluetooth, for example. And that will be your PCI E Express at times four. So that will be your PCI E4. For number three, next to it, and you see two of those. So we have one over here in blue and another one here in blue. And you would see a clip at the end of it. And that is your PCI E times 16. So the difference between the X4 and the X16 is that X16 is much faster as it would use 16 times the speed compared to four times the speed. So think of it like a highway where you can have 16 lanes to send more cars down compared to four lanes to send more cars down. So we definitely want to use the X16 if we can that will give us higher performance for that particular adapter. But if you already use those slots, you can then install the X4 um, as it would be available on this particular motherboard. Not all motherboard would have um, all the expansion slot as what you would see. Then for four, this is the one here. This is your main connection for your processor. So this is your socket. So we would call this the CPU socket. And CPU socket is then would be used to install processor onto the motherboard. Now you would have this little lever on the side here, and that is called ZIF, Z-I-F. And th this is known as ZIF because it's zero insertion force. 
So when you sit your processor on top, there is a little triangle. You want to align that triangle with the socket triangle, so that would indicate pin 1. Then instead of pressing down on it, we don't want to press down on it. We Before we insert it, we have to lift up the zip, line up the triangle, and then we simply pull down the lever so that way it would sit the processor to the pin. So we don't need to press our finger on top. After you pull the lever down, then what you can do is you can put a thermal paste on top. And once you have the thermal paste on top, then you can uh, put your heat sink, which includes your fan, on top of that. Now, keep in mind that the socket for Intel is different than the AMD. So the motherboard is designed for a specific processor. And not I, Intel use the same socket, so you want to make sure that you look at the model of the CPU and the motherboard specification to make sure that it is the right socket. And also, your your um, heat sink will fit for a specific type of processor and motherboard. So we want to make sure that it would have the proper um, connection for your heat sink. Otherwise, it's going to be loose and it would not cool your system properly. So you would have these screw mount here on the parameter of the socket, and you would be able to. Uh, use that to to mount your heat sink. Now, if you want to use um, liquid cooling, you still have to have fans uh, mounted to the processor. But it, instead of using um, regular air cool, where it will cool cold air from the outside in, um, and then take the hot air and send it out. Um, you would then have the fan that's going to pull the cold air and and send it through the um, the pipe, which contains liquid that would cool your processor. But we want to be careful when we install those, um, because if you break the the line for the liquid um, and it gets onto your motherboard, then likely that you would destroy the motherboard. So. For number five, which is these slots here, and you would see there are two black slots and there are two blue slots. These are used for RAM, and we want to install them in pair with the color coding. So we wanted to put the blue pair or the black pair, and in some case, we might use all four. And remember that they need to be equal because they are dual. And as we talked about that in the last video. So 5 is your DDR memory slot or your RAM slot. Number 6 is the black connection here. And you would see that they would have these um, two rows of, of little holes that you would connect. And that is really used for power connection. That's where we're going to be able to power your motherboard. So that is a 24-pin ATX power connector. And also, again, we, we want to refer to the form factor for the case. The motherboard and the ATX plays an important role in the power supply selection. So we want to make sure that our power supply also fit in the case and the connection would be suitable for our motherboard. Then for 7, you would see that this would be your USB 3.0 header. And there is a cable that will be blue from your case. You need to connect that there so that way you can use your USB 3.1 or 3.x. Then for 8, that is your front serial ATA ports. This is used for drives. And the drives, we would put them into the case uh, bay, which are these little metal cages inside your case that we can mount your hard drive. Um, or, you know, if you use a hybrid drive, you'll be able to mount that there. But you would need to use your serial ATA cable. They are flat cable with an L-shaped connector. 
um, to be able to connect your drive. So some motherboard would have capability to connect three, four, six, or even more drives, but in some cases you might have two or three. And then for nine over here on the left, that will be your USB 2.0 port header. That is for our USB 2.0. For 10, here on the left, which is this group right here, you would see that that will be your front panel cable header, which I just talked about. So that allows you to connect the cable to your case. And so you can use the ports in front of your case along with your power button. So if you don't connect that, you won't be able to use your USB or press power to your case because, um, or if you don't connect it properly, when you press the power, it won't turn on. So then we would look at 11, which is right here. That is your fan header cable. This is used to, to power your fan and fans can be for case fan or, and you would see that also over here on this side. They are usually white with, with the four pins. So we would then need to connect the fan cable so that way it can be used. So when you turn on your system, your motherboard would take the power and send that to the components, including the fan that's connected to it. Then number 12 is going to be your CMOS battery. So your CMOS battery is the flat round battery that's located here. So as you can see that we would have the majority of the com the connection and the components area that we can identify on this motherboard. And when we look at your bus, as we talked about your bus or your slot, when we did the lab from the prior week, we saw that the PCI slot, it's usually, it's white. And that is an older slot on an older motherboard. Compare that to the PCI Express or PCIe bus. The PCI X is 64 bit, which is much faster than the PCI in transfer rate. So that will be 16 bit. So when you look at the newer motherboard, you would see that there is the Express and the X. So that way you would use those instead of the older technology. So we want to make sure that we find the components that would be compatible with our bus type and we can connect that so we can use it at the top performance. So now let's switch back to the notes. It's, it goes over um, processor compatibility. So important things about Intel is that Intel uses LGA, um, which is land grid array. It is a way that, here we go, um, it is a way that we would use the form factor for the CPU, the physical size and connection of the CPU. So Intel LGA is different than your AMD, which uses your pin grid array form factor, which is PGA. And so PGA is different in size compared to LGA. So when you buy the motherboard and your processor, it will tell you an LGA and the number that will be the socket value. And with that, you would be able to identify the motherboard and that will be compatible to the CPU. On the AMD, you would see that it would say AM3 plus or 4 plus or some other type of socket value. Um, that will pertain to its physical size for the processor. And we would find the same value. We would use that for our motherboard. So here it touches on zero insertion force. Make sure we know LGA and PGA for test exam and CompTIA certification. We also um, here it, you know, need to know about zero insertion for or ZIF. And that's important. Then for the CPU, 
we want to use the newer CPUs are 64 bit it will not work on the 32-bit motherboard so if you have an older motherboard and you buy a new CPU of course that will not be compatible so also RAM capability so we want to make sure that we check the specification of the motherboard and any kind of component that we want to attach to it to make sure that it is compatible and so that way we can build our system now um, in the last part here it for question 14 it asks you what are the main characteristics of LGA LGA uses let me zoom back in here so we can see LGA uses spring-loaded LANs for the processor socket that connects the bumps on the back side of the processor the number of LANs on the processor socket is used for the numeric part of the socket name. So when you see LGA 1150, all that is the 1150 value is the number of LANs that would be built for that socket. Now, the main difference is that LGA is spring loaded LANs where PGA is going to be uh, pin integrated. So now they all have um, a way to identify the pin one or the top of the processor. So make sure that we install that. We wanted to put in the appropriate, um, the appropriate side of the processor to the socket. What are the main differences? main characteristics of the MPGA this uses pins and on the back side of the CPU and to connect the pins to the processor socket so you see that with the AMD it uses pin and then the Intel uses LANs for the disconnection we would see that SATA connection is 6 gigabit per second that is your current SATA 3 um, and so if you're using an older SATA you would have less of a transfer rate so all your serial ATA connection for your drive that will be 6 gigabit per second for SATA 3 and earlier we talked about the purpose of UEFI UEFI is used to check connection for components test devices it checks error and it set up boot so it needs all of this in order to boot your system so it needs to verify all the components are connected so if your RAM is not connected it won't be able to, to start because your operating system uses RAM um, and then it also tests your devices so it sends electric signal to the device and if the device received that then it would go through the OK check then it, if there's any kind of error that would be the stage so this is the pre-boot process and then it's going to look at the boot sequence which drives are going to be allowed to boot first now in virtualization hyperthreading and overclocking we know that virtualization is used to um, to manage virtual versions of your computer using uh, software tools so that way we would be able to have different virtual operating system running inside the host um, so create virtualization is used to create manage virtual sessions for the computer and for the AMD and the Intel processor virtualization support is known as hardware assisted virtualization so that's an important thing to note, hardware assisted virtualization. So we need to enable that capability on the processor in order to use the software to create and manage our virtualization uh, OS. And then hyperthreading technology was developed by Intel for processing two execution threads within a single processor core. Then we have overclocking is just a way that we change 
we we include so that will be in the modify multipliers to increase clock speed of the processor so that way we can make your processor run faster but it will also be hotter and for 19 you can go on the internet we are going to locate an Intel or an AMD processor that has an integrated GPU and that will be simple we can simply um, visit a website like new a and we can find a processor so let's say if I wanted to do Intel CPU with integrated GPU I can put in a search there and I do see some uh, now the onboard is going to be on the motherboard and then on the processor we will see that here here is the coffee lake 6 core this is an older i5 9th generation so you can find something like that there and in the description it will tell you so earlier we talked about land grid array and how many lands that would be so you would see that there that will be the socket for this processor and then um, it would tell you that so we would you need to use GPU <clears throat> so in this one it doesn't have the integrated graphics we can also find another processor like the i9 here so if you're able to identify um, so on this one it also doesn't have the graphics but you will be able to identify by searching through the internet for it um, often that you will find integrated graphics on the motherboard okay compared to what you've seen in some of the um, processor but there are processors that have integrated graphics then on number 20 we want to highlight a few important points about CPU compatibility we talked about that earlier CPU form factor that pertains to LGA or PGA or MPGA um, the socket on the motherboard that would fit that particular CPU the graphic features and also your bit size, whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit. And that's important um, when you are looking to build systems or replace components, especially with the processor on your inside your computer. Okay, so um, this concludes part two of the video, and I will put together a video with the hardware components where I would use the camera to show you some of the components physically um, so you can have a better understanding on how to work with the hardware. Uh, so please look out for that video. Thank you for watching part two of the lecture.